There I'll 
serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work Go to the house of the Lord. Let our feet stand in your gates. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Let our feet stand in your gates. We will pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love you be secure. May there always be peace within your walls. May goodness and hope always endure. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Let our feet stand in your gates. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Let our feet stand in your gates. For the sake of our brothers and our friends, may peace be days for the sake of the house of the Lord our God may goodness be found in all your ways let your kingdom rise let your people sing of your matchless grace and your endless mercy let your church cry out let hosannas ring from the highest hill and the deep end. when it's time for us to get started I would say that everyone where you are, you're perfectly fine, but if you would love to come to the front and even out the weight of the building toward the front of the foundation, we'd love for some of you to come forward if you'd like to, but you're certainly good where you are. It always makes our singing better and it makes the speakers feel more connected to you. If you're closer to the front, we'd love for you to come up a little closer. The first song we're going to sing today uh, is Oh Worship the King. The focus of our lecture this weekend, I'll introduce the speakers in a little bit, uh, is going to be centered around the call of following Jesus as our King. And so I hope that you'll be encouraged by the songs that we sing as we join together in that worship. Number 18, O oh, Worship the King.
Hey, so uh, some of the songs are going to be repeats from the Kleinwood singing. Fun fact, I uh, had to pick them out before that. So terribly sorry, but you're going to have to sing some of the same great songs twice. Our first song, however, is As the Deer. If you're using your hymnals, that's uh, number two, As the Deer. Next song is Waiting for My God. This one uh, is not 1133. It is just on the slides. Waiting for My God.
long till the morning? 7-12. We don't get to sing this song here too much, but I know a bunch of you know it, so I got to pick it. Before we ever opening prayer led by Luke Hodgins, I wanted to, if you don't have the uh, notes for the lecture this morning, please raise your hand and these guys will pass out to you uh, those notes while I make these opening announcements. Keep your hand raised so that you can be served. But we're really glad that you're here. I hope that you've been encouraged by the singing already. Uh, it is a pleasure to have all of you with us and we hope that you'll stay th with us throughout the day. And if you don't have an obligation tomorrow, we'd love for you to finish the weekend with us here at the Woodlands Church in our morning worship in the morning. Also at 5 o'clock, we have our first Sunday of the month singing, so if you would like to join us for that at 5 o'clock, you're certainly welcome. But we're really glad to welcome with us today Jacob Hudgens and Bill Sanchez, who'll be doing the speaking here in the auditorium. Uh, Bill's home is in New York City. Uh, he currently worships and works with the Embry Hills Church in uh, Embry Hills, but it's really Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we're really glad to have him. Uh, I'll let him tell us a little bit more about his personal story as he works it into his lesson, uh, but we're really glad that his wife, Heather, has let him come. They have one child, and she's due in about four weeks, and so we're really glad that she's sharing him. Uh, with us this weekend. Glad to have Jacob with us as well, Jacob Hudgens, who preaches for the Twin City Church and College Station. I'm not quite sure how that happened since he graduated from Texas A&M 
uh, in 2004, uh, but we're really glad to have him. I've heard great things about both of these men and the work that they do, and we're grateful for his wife, Sarah, uh, for sharing him and his uh, sons with us today. When we have the breakout session, uh, Courtney Oles, whose home is in Houston, uh, but worships with the church in Kleinwood, uh, is a, a kindergarten teacher uh, and graduated from SFA in Nacogdoches. Um, one of the things that probably defines her is be known for the beauty that comes from within. And so we're excited to have her lead the young ladies, ages 13 through 18, in classroom number five during the breakout session. And then Hunter Allen, whose um, home is Lufkin, uh, but he and his wife worship at the Kleinwood Church where he is working as an intern uh, for about a year. He graduated from Lamar, loves music like I do, and uh, glad to have him. And he'll teach the young men ages 13 to 18 in classroom nine when we go through the breakout session. So I'm, I'm glad that you're here. All of these things are done, shared online uh, and streamed, and so you can find that on YouTube at our links there or on our website, woodlandschurchofchrist.org. Glad that you're here. Join us in this worship, and let's be led in our prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come here today and learn more about your word with our brothers and sisters. Please help us to be edified and to grow and become better people and better Christians in our service to you today. Uh, please help us to grow in fellowship with our brothers and sisters and to make new friends and renew old friendships. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 3 to start. So go ahead and open a Bible there, or if you're doing the uh, phone Bible or whatever, get your uh, whatever means you're using to access the Word, uh, get it open to that place. Matthew chapter 3. I, I thought when Don uh, made the announcement and he said that Bill's home was in New York, I thought he said Bill's phone was in New York, which would be lame, right? But... Uh, we might uh, take this moment while we're thinking about phones to kind of turn everything off uh, because uh, things are going to ding and ring and things. So let's, uh, let's be focused on what we're doing as we, as we share together in the Word of God. I am so thrilled to be with you. Uh, I'm excited about what we're going to do. We're studying about Lord, reign in me. And we are going to focus our attention today on the Sermon on the Mount, which is a royal address. It is the King speaking. And I want us to get our heads around that for a few minutes in this part of our study, where we think about what it means for the king to speak to you, what it would be like to be addressed by a king. So Matthew 3 and verse 1, read this with me. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. I'd like to ask, raise your hand if you've met a famous person. All right. We have any, uh, have you met a famous athlete? Raise your hand. Famous athlete. Okay. Uh, famous political figure. Anybody? Okay. What's it like when you meet a famous person? It's kind of a, an interesting experience uh, because uh, you, you see them and you realize, hey, this is just a person like me. Like, they kind of look like me. Maybe if they're an athlete, they're super tall or something. But I met Yao Ming once, and uh, that dude's tall. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember him, but he's like seven foot six. And uh, he's sitting in a row, and it's like person, 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 Yao Ming, person, person. Uh, but uh, one time, I was, I was blessed to be able to meet uh, George W. Bush. And we had this epic exchange. It's kind of awkward when you meet someone and you actually have to say something to them because, I mean, what do you say to someone? I I'm a nobody, and he at the time was governor of the state of Texas. And so we had this exchange. I shook his hand and I said, wow. And he said, I know, right? And then he moved on down the handshake line. I still remember it, but it's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, because 
later on he would become president. I've met another president. And uh, when, you, when you meet people, and they're just people, but they're people who have a great fame or great power, um, you, you kind of view them a little differently. You don't view them the way you view ordinary people. And that's just something with regular people that we experience. But what we're reading here, when we read about a king or we hear about a king, is about something that's a little bit higher. And I want us to get our minds around that as we approach the Sermon on the Mount this morning. So the ancient world had what were called heralds. Heralds, their function was to go ahead of a king and tell everybody, hey, the king is coming. You know, we still do this. If the president is coming to town, he doesn't just show up. You got the secret service, you got plans made, you got everything to prepare for the king. And in the ancient world, you didn't want the king to come to your town and there would be a bunch of trash in the streets. You didn't want a king to come to town and everybody be asleep or out in the field. You got to make ready for the king. It's the king. And so when John is described, look there at verse 3. It says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Get ready. The king is coming. The king is coming. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Here comes the king. I want us to think about what it would be like if you and I were here, and instead of Jacob Hudgens and Bill Sanchez, the speaker for the day was Jesus. How would we react to that? Do you think you might take notes? Do you think the building would be a little more full? If it was Jesus, do you think we'd hang on every word? Do you think we'd get sleepy? You see, when Jesus speaks, there's a reaction that's expected. And that's the reaction we still need to have because Jesus is still speaking. And that's what I want us to think about for a few minutes. One of the great dangers we have in Bible study is that we forget who's talking. We think it's just a book. We think it's just, I don't know, some old white guy who's up there talking. And man, is he still going on about this? Instead of remembering, this is the king. So let's think about that. I want to start. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to take a little bit and go through some passages. You can see them on your sheet, a few of them. Uh, if you have your sheet, we're going to fill in some of these blanks as we go along. And uh, if I miss a blank, uh, I will try to come back and get it because uh, I might not always see exactly where we are on the list. But let's, let's start in Matthew 1. <clears throat> Matthew 1 and verse 1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I want you to notice that what this verse means is that Jesus is a king. So if you have your blank there, fill that in the blank. Jesus is a king. Two words that show that in verse 1. One is the word Christ or Messiah, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, Messiah, and Messiah was a king. And it also says in verse 1, he is the son of David, and David's line is the royal line. It's the line of kings. So when Jesus is called son of David, they are saying, Jesus, you are king. You are not a carpenter's son. You are not merely a rabbi. You are not a guy with some good ideas. You are king. So already from the beginning of Matthew's gospel, the very first thing he says we're expected to perk up and say, wow, just like we would if someone famous or important or powerful were talking to us, we're going to read the story of the king. A little later in chapter 1, look down in verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 20. It says, but as he, Joseph, considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus is not only a king, Jesus is more than a king. He is God with us. So when we look at Jesus, when we hear Jesus speak, we are hearing what God would say if God were a person, because God is a person when Jesus is here on earth. Those are some really special and unique things to say about someone. And we're not even to the part where Jesus is talking yet. This is just groundwork for what Jesus is and what he's going to do and be. Turn the page to Matthew 2. In Matthew 2 and verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. What are they asking? We've been watching the stars, and we know there's a star that told us someone's been born king of the Jews. Now, that's some pretty impressive star watching. 
but he's king. And so they're here to, to worship the king. We want to honor him. So even people outside of Israel who are main, maybe not even expecting a king now see the king coming, and they've come to worship him. Who are they thinking of? Well, they go to Bethlehem because that's where Jesus is. And so these are some pretty unique and special things to say about a baby. I have three children, and I can tell you some things that people say when a baby is born. People typically say some of the same things. They say things like, oh, they're so cute, even when they're not. Let's be real. Or we say things like, oh, what a smart kid. They have a really bright future. Someday they're going to be this or that. But what we don't do when a baby is born, you don't go see someone's new baby and say, oh, that baby's going to be king of the Jews. Oh, that baby looks like God with us. We don't say those things. That would, that would weird us out. It's a little too much. But those are things said about Jesus from his birth. People are making a fuss over him because he is more than just a regular human. Turn the page to Matthew 3 and verse 16. Matthew 3 and verse 16, it says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I have been baptized. That didn't happen to me. Did it happen to you? Voice from heaven? This is my beloved Son? Now, I do believe in some sense I am a son of God, but not like this. This is unique. This is someone special. This is the king, and not only the king, not only God with us, but the son of God. And so the next few verses in chapter 4, when Satan takes him out into the wilderness to tempt him, notice the temptation. Look at Matthew 4 and verse 3. It says, The tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Did you notice those are not ordinary temptations? They start with, if you are the son of God. So prove yourself, Jesus. If everything about, everything I'm hearing is legit, you prove yourself. And then he says, here's how you can prove it. You can use your power to make stones into bread. Have you ever been tempted to do that? To use your powers to make stones into bread? See, this is different. He's a different person. And so when he starts preaching, Jesus begins to preach about his own kingship, the kingdom of God. Look in chapter 4 and verse 17. Chapter 4 and verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 4 and verse 23, he went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, repent, the kingdom is here. And he gathers people to talk to them about the kingdom. Here is what God is doing through me. This is what all this mission is about. Here is what God with us says to you. And what we are studying today is the royal address. The king has come and the king has decided to talk to you. And here is what he has to say. There is one more statement before we jump into the body of what we're going to do. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, where Jesus says, uh, Jesus came and said to them, this is after his resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Can you realize how audacious that is for a person to say that? I, I have all power in heaven and on earth. And yet Jesus is saying, you need to hear me. I have things to tell you that are teachings with authority. So, Let's talk about this then, about the king and his words. First of all, I want to show you that this is a teaching with authority and that because it's a teaching with authority, it's going to affect how we hear it. It matters how you listen. It matters how we respect the authority of Jesus. At the end of this sermon, in Matthew chapter 7, it talks about how uh, they were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. And I want us to think about that. We, when someone has authority, we listen to them differently. Can you raise your hand if you have a little sister? 
Lots of little sisters. All right, so if your little sister tells you to do something, she says you have to eat your vegetables, do you do it? If your little sister bosses you around, are you going to obey her? Okay, I know, I know what happens in my house. I have, I have three kids. I have two older boys and a, a little sister, a daughter. And they never, ever, ever do anything she says, ever. I'm assuming that's pretty much the rule, right? Why? She's the little sister. She has no authority. In fact, it could be a big sister. It could be a big brother. It doesn't matter. The kids don't obey the kids because they don't have the authority to direct one another, and they know it. The difference is authority. Or if some random stranger comes up to you and tries to tell you what to do, they say, hey, you got to get out of this room. You might even ask them, who are you? Because we respond to authority, but if someone doesn't have authority, we kind of say, I'm not going to do what you say. There's a way we listen when we know someone has authority. And sometimes, you know, if you're a, a younger person and you look at an adult, you've been taught, okay, adults have some authority and I'm going to listen to them and kind of obey them. But, but there is something here that Jesus is saying, that because of who he is, where he's from, and what he knows, he has authority over us. And that's the reason his words are a big deal. That's the reason we've gathered together to study his words. It's not because Bill has authority. It's not because Jacob has authority. It's not because Don has authority. It's because Jesus has authority. And as we read and study his words, that's what we must do. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So his words come across a little differently. In the same way that we pay a lot more attention to the president's words than to our little sister's words. There's authority behind them. Let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. <clears throat> Sorry, this is your first blank. I don't know if I was clear about the blanks. But Matthew 17, and we're going to read verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> it says, Matthew 17, verse 1, After six days Jesus took, him, took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him, and Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So if you're, if you're keeping track of the action here, Jesus is transfigured. His, his face shines. His clothes become bright. Everybody sees, wow, something amazing is happening, something that is really hard even for Matthew to describe. And as that happens, Peter does what Peter does. What does Peter do? He starts talking. Okay? He doesn't know what he's saying. We read another, another text. But he, he just says, hey, let's make some tents. You know, you got Moses and Elijah here. Let's worship Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And it's as if God says, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, Peter, I, we're not doing that. And God says, stop all of that. And the voice booms down from heaven again. This is my son. Listen to him. As if he is saying, I would rather you listen to my son even over Moses and Elijah. He is the one you need to hear. And notice the connection there. Did you notice it in verse 5? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. How many more ways can God say this? That of all the people who might have something to say, this is the one I want you to hear. The problem is, we have lots of little things like this that we might hear and say, that's pretty good advice. We might, oh, that sounds pretty good. But we don't actually hear or listen to what's being told. Uh, when I was a kid, I don't know, this, this may be out of date because I got old, but when I was a kid, people used to say, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, that's kind of cute, you know, it rhymes. Eh, it's probably promoting healthy eating. It's probably better than a pack of Skittles a day. Um, does anybody actually live by an apple a day? The early bird gets the worm. That was one that was popular when I was younger. 
Um, or, or early to bed, early to rise, keeps a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Oh, that sounds, oh, it rhymes, that's great. And so we say those things, and we're like, yeah, you know, that's pretty good. Do you actually live by, I never, ever, ever sleep in because an early bird gets the worm? No, we, we just say, oh, that's kind of cute. That's probably a good idea. Probably shouldn't sleep all day. But we don't listen to those things as if our lives depend on them. They're just cute little sayings about how to live a, you know, moderately more happy life. What I am saying is that when you think of Jesus as king, you never hear his words as if they're cute sayings. He is the king. And so he deserves a level of hearing we give to no one else. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. This is your second blank here. Matthew 6. I want to give you an example at the risk of treading on some of Bill's material here. You'll see how much we're like Christians by how much we accept treading on each other's material. Matthew chapter 6 and uh, verse 25. So I want you to hear, just let's practice a little bit how we would listen to someone who has authority telling us about something he knows. Matthew 6 and verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Drop down a little bit to verse 30. Jesus says, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So Jesus makes some promises here. He promises that if you seek the kingdom first, you will have what you need in terms of your physical needs. He promises that, and he tells us that by saying, I know about God, your father. I know what God does for birds. I know what God does for grass, and I know how God feels about you. And I know that if you will seek his kingdom first, that everything you need will be provided. And Jesus stakes his entire reputation on this promise. The question is, how do you hear that? How do we listen? Because I think most of the time we listen to that and we say, oh, that sounds nice, but I'm not so sure. Especially as we get a little older and we start worrying about money stuff, and we're not sure how exactly that's all going to work, and we start to say, you know what? If I'm really focused on God's stuff, I don't know about my finances. I don't know where that's going to come from. Things aren't going well for me. How is this working? And so we're tempted to say, let me take the wheel and let me not trust Jesus. I am saying if you believe Jesus is king, then his words take on a new authority. Suddenly, you know, this is not like an apple a day keeps the doctor away. This is ironclad. You can take it to the bank and trust that if I do seeking his kingdom first, I will have what I need. So let me remind you that Jesus knows things we don't, that Jesus is God with us, that Jesus knows things about God we don't. He knows things about us we don't. We'll talk more about that later today. And Jesus is making promises on God's behalf that we can trust. But let me say, and this is your blank here, the greatest struggle we have in letting Jesus reign in us is that we do not take his words seriously enough. The greatest struggle we have in letting Jesus reign in us is that we do not take his words seriously seriously enough. His teaching has authority. Second, Jesus has power to change lives, and that affects how we submit. So before we start too far down this road where we think Jesus is just pulling rank and saying, I'm the boss, do what I say or else, there is also this, that Jesus' teaching is good for us. We need it. And this is where I believe it's important to understand the kingdom idea that we're going to talk about a lot today. So the kingdom idea is just a big set of ideas that are very confusing to most people. And yet I think in Jesus' teaching, 
It's a rather simple idea. Like we talked about, letting God reign in us. Letting God have control of our lives. His kingdom is when God is in charge and I am not. So, I want to show you what that looks like and why you want that. Look with me in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. I love Matthew 13 because Jesus uses some pictures in Matthew 13 that help the kingdom come alive. So if you're confused by that idea, you have a set of things that are really concrete, stuff that you see all the time, that now you can say that's what the kingdom is like. Matthew 13, we're going to read verses 31 to 33. Matthew 13, 31 to 33. It says, he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. So what's the kingdom like, Jesus? He says, well, take these two things, and they're, they're sort of twins. They're the same idea, but in two different pictures. One is the idea of a mustard seed, this very, very small seed. And you plant it, and in just a little while, it becomes a great big tree. Little thing, tremendous, disproportionate growth that comes out of it. Or it's like leaven. I don't know if you guys have spent much time dealing with uh, yeast and stuff. I would suppose that would be more of the ladies than the boys, but little bit of leaven, and you sprinkle it into the dough, and suddenly it just spreads, and it goes throughout the whole dough. You don't really have a loaf of bread, and you have half of it leaven and half of it flat. It just, it just spreads. That's just what the kingdom is. The kingdom is something that spreads and grows and thrives. So I want you to hear this. God's reign in your life is a restless ready to grow, change, expand, correct, bear fruit kind of force. And when it gets a hold of you and it gets into your life, it doesn't let go. It keeps growing. It keeps spreading. This is the power where Jesus looks at a bunch of fishermen and says, I will make you become fishers of men. And he looks at a tax collector and he says, follow me. And suddenly that man is not collecting taxes anymore. He's not dishonest anymore. He becomes someone preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is how God turns weaknesses into strengths. How Peter, instead of being a guy who just can't get his foot out of his mouth, becomes the one who is out in front preaching the gospel. God does that in us. God changes us. And that is the power of the kingdom. That's why we want God to reign in us. Lord, reign in me. I need you. I want you. This is good for me. You want the kingdom. You want God's reign in your heart. You want the Spirit of God living in you, producing his fruit. This is what you want. You want God to break into your life and set things in order. When you have things in your life that you know are not good, you know are not what you should be, you want God to come in. This is the gospel. And Jesus is saying... I'm wanting to come in. I'm knocking. This is the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom is here, and the king is ready to speak. So the kingdom will change you for the better forever. That's for your blank. The kingdom will change you for the better forever. This is what you want. So it's not just that Jesus is saying, hey, I'm the king. Hey, everybody, shape up. Get in line. King's here. It is also the king's here, and he wants to do things for you you can't do for yourself. He wants to make changes in you, and he has a vision for you that is far beyond your vision for yourself. It's not about you achieving your dreams. It's about you achieving God's dreams for you, that God has a plan for you and a way he will use you and perfect you. But we have to then be willing to submit, to say, you know what? I want his way over my own, because that is where the power to change lives comes in. So when Jesus begins to speak, never forget, he is the one who has the power to change your life, and now he is telling you how to do it. Let's do a little practice here, and go back to Matthew chapter 5. 
Again, I'm going to take some of Bill's material and see how he responds later. Uh, see if he's willing to turn the other cheek about it. Matthew chapter 5. So uh, I want to give you two examples here in Matthew 5 about some insights that, if you allow them, will change your life. That what might begin as you just reading a passage this morning, small little seed, a little bit of leaven, that if you let it grow and you think about it and you start thinking about how I could change this and you start making a little progress here and there, suddenly it will become something far greater than the little seed that's planted this morning. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. This is an insight that if you allow it will change your life. The insight is this. Treating other people is not about, I didn't kill anyone today. Treating other people is about a higher way of learning to control my own anger and frustration with them. And if you want to pursue God's will, let God reign in your life, then it's going to take more than just saying, well, I can't kill anyone today. The bar is a little higher. And so he talks about, don't say you fool. Don't be angry with your brother. Don't be critical of one another. Learn to control yourself. That's a little C. And in that little seed, I hope you hear that there are times in your life where you are out of control in your anger and you know it. When you do things or say things or you smash things or there are words that you remember saying or there are times when people have approached you and said, you shouldn't have done that. And you know that there are times where you are just out of control in your anger. And so the question becomes, are you going to submit to Jesus' will for your anger? That's the question. And I am saying, if Jesus were here teaching instead of me, and he said these words, would you listen a little different? Would you say, you know, maybe it's time. Maybe this is an area that needs correction now. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is an insight that if you allow it, will change your life. The insight is that we can commit sexual sin without committing actual sexual sin. That what's important when we talk about the sexual realm, is whether or not we are out of control. And that is, in Jesus' words, something as simple as a look. A look that is calculated to excite sexual interest in us. I'm looking to lust. So we can talk about, well, sexual purity means I don't cross certain lines. And that's true. But we're not sexually pure simply because we haven't committed the act. Jesus, again, is raising the bar. Now, I don't know how you hear that this morning, but I would suspect that just like with anger, all of us have a part of us that says, you know what, sometimes I'm not what I should be in this area. Sometimes those thoughts, the actions that I take with them, sometimes that's just out of control. And so it's easy to say, well, I haven't done anything that bad. I mean, my rap sheet's not that long. But... What if the king was here speaking? And he says to you, you're not looking the way you should look. Even your heart about this is wrong. Would we listen? I am suggesting that little mustard seed of teaching, if you start thinking about how am I looking? What am I thinking about? What's going on in my heart? Why am I so focused on the sexual side of life? What is it about this that is dominating my thinking and my actions? that that little mustard seed can become a great big tree in your heart, a tree of sexual purity, of you being in control of your thinking and your actions and your interactions with the other sex, that you can change forever because God's reigning in you. That's what Jesus is doing in this sermon. Just a little saying, just a little 
thinking that comes from the king that now we need to submit. So God wants to reign in us. But it will boil down to how seriously we take his words. Can I say something about that, by the way? Um, it's a funny thing. Because these days, because of social media, um, we kind of have this instinct that whenever we hear something, we, we want to um, we wanna like it or retweet it or upvote it or whatever you know, social media thing you're into. And uh, so we kind of have this spirit now in our culture where any saying or teaching, we think we get to uh, judge it. Say, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't like that one. But I do like that one. And then there's also the arena where we say, you know what, I'll just keep scrolling. Not even comment on it. I think in doing so, we really miss that these are not suggestions. That Jesus is not just saying, hey, here's some ideas for you to think about if you feel like it. These are the words of the king. And now submission is expected. What are you going to do? If your life is going to change, it must be because you submit to the king. And the third thing I want to show you is that Jesus has what we're going to call, let's see if that'll go, there it is, power over life and death. And that affects whom we fear, whom we trust, and whom we follow. I'll give you a second to write all that down. Power over life and death. And that affects whom we fear, whom we trust, and whom we follow. My mom's an English teacher, so I had to put whom, because that's correct. This is a whole nother level. We've talked a lot about, I mean, Jesus is a special and unique person. And we've talked about that. But to say someone has power over life and death is a claim even beyond that he's king, that he's the son of God, beyond everything that we've said. This is another level. So uh, the first quotation I have there is from John chapter 11, where Jesus is speaking to Mary, I mean, to Martha at the grave of Lazarus. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Have you thought about, if Jesus is just a dude, how ridiculous that is. For someone to say, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you'll never die. That's a claim. It is an audacious claim. But he is saying, I have power over life and death. And he demonstrates that in John 11, doesn't he? Because pretty quickly after this, he says to Lazarus, come out of the grave, and out he walks. Can't even walk because his feet are bound together with the grave clothes. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 10 for a second. Matthew chapter 10. I want to show you how this affects our fear idea. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34. I'm sorry, 24. Matthew 10, 24. It says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So, have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So it's natural for us, he says, to fear somebody who can kill us. But he says, don't fear them if all they can do is kill your body. Because that's a, there's a limit there to their power. But fear him who can cast body and soul into hell. That's the one you should fear. He says, there's a greater being with a greater power. Fear him. This is important because especially when we are young, although it persists as we age, we get really concerned about what other people think about us. You know, do other people like us? Are we popular? And this is to say, even when we are tempted to do things that we shouldn't to impress people, even when we are tempted to compromise on what we know is right, that there is nothing we should fear greater than we fear God. Jesus is saying, what power do those people have? Have you thought about that with your friends? 
Have you thought about that with fitting in with people? Like, what power do they have? If you don't fit in with them, if they don't like you, what are they going to do? What are we afraid of? What's the worst case scenario here? But they say something? It's extremely unlikely they're going to hurt us physically even. What are we fearing? Jesus is saying there's a higher fear. And that's the one that should govern us. And that's what he's appealing to. I'm the one with real power here. Listen to me. In fact, you can trust and you can follow me. Go with me to John chapter 10. John 10. Don't worry, for those who are starting to panic because we're running out of time and we still have some blanks left, we'll, we'll get through it. We'll make it work. John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, Jesus uses the comparison of himself and a good shepherd. And I want to read with you John 10. We're going to read 11 to 18. John 10 and verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So Jesus talks about other people who are trying to lead the sheep, trying to lead people, trying to get people to follow them. And he says they are hired hands. They don't care about the sheep. So when a crisis comes, when the wolf comes, they're going to leave the sheep and flee. Just think about it. If you were doing a day job and you were a shepherd, and so, you know, you're getting paid minimum wage to be a shepherd, and here comes the wolf. Hmm. Are you going to stand up and fight the wolf and maybe die for your minimum wage job and a sheep that belonged to somebody else? If you're a hired man, you're out of there. You're going to save your own skin. And Jesus says, that's what people do. They try to follow you, but they're not there for you. They don't care about you. He says, I'm here for you. I lay down my life for the sheep. Let me make that a little more practical. There are people all around you who want you to follow them. You know what that looks like today. They all are, maybe they're celebrities, entertainers, and musicians. Maybe there are people who have their own podcasts and book lines. Uh, some of them are religious leaders. Everybody's got their own, you know, Instagram and their own uh, product line that they're selling you. And they want you to follow them. Why? They don't want you to follow them because it'll be good for you. They want you to follow them because they want something out of you. They want your money. They want, you to, they want to get a big group of fans so that they become popular and prominent and wealthy. So what happens? If you need something from them, eh, they don't care. Why would we trust and follow people who don't care about us? Jesus says, I can prove to you that I tr you can trust me and that I'm here for you. Jesus can be trusted because he has already laid down his life for us. That's your blank, by the way. He has already laid down his life for us. You know you can trust him. You know you can follow him. You know you can fear him because you know he has your best interest at heart. There's never any question. If you ever start to doubt it, you ever worry about it, go back to the cross. It's still there. He's still dying so that you could be free. Jesus wants your good. And he has gone to the grave to prove it. And now he has come back from the grave and he says, follow me. So here comes the king. He is speaking. He has a teaching with authority. And we need to listen to it. He has the power to change our lives. And we need to be willing to submit to it. And he then has power over our own life and death. And so we fear him. We trust him. We follow him. I've got one last little part here at the bottom of your sheet. We won't look at these passages, but I just want to briefly mention this. When you get done with the Sermon on the Mount, if you keep reading in Matthew, what you'll notice is that Jesus keeps talking. And everything Jesus says Something happens when he says it. So he talks to the centurion's servant from afar, and he rebukes the fever. 
and that man is healed when Jesus doesn't even see him. And he casts out demons by just talking to them. And he stills the storm by speaking to it. And on and on it goes. The wind and the sea respond to Jesus. The demons respond to Jesus. Sicknesses respond to Jesus. Did you know everything in the created world responds to Jesus? Everything he says, things happen, except you and me. The only ones who resist the power and authority of Jesus are human beings. And God has allowed us the choice of whether we will submit and listen. At least he has allowed us that choice for now. So the question is, will we listen? Will we submit? Here comes the king. Listen to him. So let me just say, as we work through the Sermon on the Mount this weekend, we're going to be confronted with some challenging teaching. You will be shortly in our breakout sessions and later on throughout this day. There are going to be some things that seem to stretch you or may seem above you. Just remember, the king is speaking, and all of human history has built toward his arrival, and now he is here. So don't be the one part of his world that is in rebellion against him. Obey the king. Thanks for your attention. We're going to uh, begin the breakout session. Uh, everyone who is younger than 13 and older than 18, this is your breakout room, so you have no place to move. Uh, but you can stand up, stretch your legs, and we'll get started here pretty shortly. Uh, so I'm going to ask all the young men who are 13 through 18 years old to stand up and start walking toward classroom number 9. That's in the very back of the hallway. And now the young ladies, you're in classroom number five, which is that you'll see it with the double doors wide open at the end of the hallway. <laughs> 